So I'm a 21 year old male and this experience happened last summer while I was on vacation at Myrtle Beach with my family. We were staying in a resort right on the beach and were on the 13th or 14th floor in a sort of timeshare. One night I was feeling restless and having a hard time falling asleep and at around 3am I decided to go out on the balcony to get some air. I stepped out and was stunned as there was a full moon and the moonlight on the water was really beautiful. The beach was completely empty as far as I could see and I had never seen it like that before. I decided that since I wasn't able to sleep I might as well head down, take a stroll and listen to some music to relax. Hopefully when I returned I'd be able to get some sleep. It was really unsafe and dumb of me but since it was 3am and the rest of my family was asleep I decided to just head down without letting any of them know I was going as I thought I would just go and chill there for about 10-15 to 15 minutes then come right back up. So at the base of the timeshare we were at, there was an area with a pool, an outdoor bar, and then two boardwalks separated by about a hundred feet, which both led to the beach. On the sides of the boardwalks, there were swaths of tall grass separating the ocean and the resort. When I got down to the base, the entire area was completely deserted, and I started walking down the boardwalk on the right towards the beach. As I'm walking down, I suddenly see someone approaching me from the beach, which was strange because I had a pretty clear view of the same area from the balcony just before and had literally seen no one. I start to get a bit nervous as I see this figure approach and as I get closer, I see it as a man, maybe in his late 30s, who has a backpack on and is wearing glasses with large square lenses. As he gets closer, I get a clearer look at him as the boardwalk is sort of illuminated by lights from the outdoor bar. He looks very on edge and alert, almost like he's trying to find someone who's trying to meet him in this area and his clothes are somewhat tattered. We made eye contact and I sort of nod at him and pass. At this point I'm creeped out because honest to god he had a sort of Jeffrey Dahmer look, he was the glasses and he just didn't seem like he actually belonged to the timeshare. I shake it off and keep walking down the beach and put my headphones in. As I get down to the beach, I turn right and start walking parallel to the water, and I'm just taking in the scenery. I'm barefoot and decided to be nice to walk just along the shoreline, so I move closer to the water and continue walking. I'm walking for no longer than a minute before I get a really, really strange feeling that something is wrong. I take off my headphones and turn around and I see a dark figure that is trailing me just up shore. He is situated in between me and the timeshare. I immediately can tell from the figure's height, body type, and demeanor that it is the same man I passed on the boardwalk. At this point I'm starting to panic as every story from Let's Read is rushing to my head. At the same time I'm trying to rationalize as it feels too surreal that I may actually be in a dangerous situation, so I remind myself it could just be a coincidence and the man decided he also wanted to take a walk on the beach and just happened to be headed in the same direction as me. So I take some breaths and turn my head back to the ocean and continue walking in the same direction. After a couple of seconds I turn my head back again and seeing that now, he is much closer to me and is not walking parallel to me but is definitely actually walking towards me. I picked up my walking speed now and turn my head back around and see he is matching my faster pace and is still walking towards me and the water. Still for some reason I think, okay. Maybe he also wants to walk by the water. There's no way I'm actually being followed by a creepy man on a deserted beach. So at this point, to truly test it, I do a 180 and completely change directions. And as I turn my head, I see him completely change directions with me and continue closing in distance. And he's power walking now. It suddenly hits me that I'm in a really bad situation. And I take off in a run along the water and he starts running as well. He stays up shore of me so that if I try to run up towards the boardwalk, he will intercept me. I'm freaking out now and just keep running with no plan, but figured that since I'm 20 and sort of fit, I should probably be able to keep running along the water and outrun him, and then find some other exit off the beach and either call my family or head back to the timeshare on the road. So I keep running, but he's keeping up with me, and this goes on for what feels like 10 to 15 minutes. The scariest part of all of this, which I wouldn't have thought of, is it is completely dead silent. 
All I hear is my breath and feet on the sand, and when I turn, I only see his shadowy figure up shore keeping pace with me. Suddenly up ahead, in the sand, I see a small blue light and what looks like four people on the beach with a blanket. They are a bit up shore. I turn and look at the figure and bet even though they are up shore, I can beat them to these people, so I start sprinting towards them with the hopes of quickly telling them what's going on so we all can confront him. I really use up my energy sprinting towards them, and as I approach, my heart drops. What I see is four guys on a blanket, with three or four handles of hard liquor surrounding them. Three of the handles are empty, and the fourth is about half empty. Three of the guys are just completely passed out in the blankets, and the last is half sat up, obviously beyond drunk, with a sort of party hat on that has blue lights on it, and he's talking to himself. His eyes are half closed and he doesn't even register me approaching him, even though now I'm no more than five feet away. I turn and see the figure has slowed down and is observing me, and then I see he makes sense of the group's state and suddenly starts sprinting at me. As he gets closer, the half-passed-out guy's blue light illuminates him, and I can clearly see it's the same guy as before. I make eye contact with him and I can see his wide-eyed and looks almost manic and is barreling at me full sprint. At this point I decided to do something decisive. It seemed like I had underestimated his fitness and since I had just sprinted towards this group and exhausted myself, I was afraid that he might be able to catch up to me if we just continued running along the beach indefinitely and then who knows what. So instead of turning around and running, I suddenly sprint towards him and to the right which I don't think he was expecting at all. I catch him off balance and run past him, and I literally am full sprinting back to the timeshare without even looking back. Literally all the hairs on my neck were standing, and it felt like a dream where you're barely evading someone, but he's right about to catch you. The adrenaline was crazy, and I keep running and start to see the timeshare. I finally turn around to see how close he is, and I see him in the distance maybe 400 to 500 feet away. He's lost a lot of distance on me. I don't waste any time and sprint up the boardwalk and towards the base of the timeshare. I jam the elevator buttons and leap in and start mashing the closed door button as I'm gasping for air. The door closes and I hit the button for my floor and when the elevator reaches, I literally sprint back to my room, open the door, enter, and then slam the door and double lock it. I'm breathing heavy and I drop to the floor and just sit there for a minute not believing what just happened. I crouch and crawl over to my room as I was literally afraid he might be able to see through the window on our balcony and I enter my room. Let's just say I definitely wasn't able to sleep after that. I used to work at a place called O'Hurley's General Store here in Shepherdston, West Virginia. It was a real old-timey general store. The kind that sells everything from buckets and barrels to books and pocket watches, in addition to the regular selection of groceries and liquor. It was an alright job for a young man such as myself, patronized by generally polite and well-meaning folk. Sure, I had a fair few drunks get a little rowdy when I wouldn't sell them hard liquor on a Sunday, but nobody ever put a gun in my face. But that ain't to say that I didn't have one or two incidents in there that put the fear of God into me, and this here is one of them. So I'm working late one Saturday night, stacking shelves and cleaning house when a man walks in wearing a black tailored suit. It was one of those that fit him like a glove and gave off an obvious air of wealth, which marked him as an out-of-towner in my book. But that suit was just about the only normal thing about him. He was white as the cotton fields, so pale he was almost gaunt, with razor-sharp facial features and slick-back silver hair. I hear the little bell on the front entrance tinkle, so I do my thing and walk back behind the counter to serve him, which is where I laid eyes on him. He walks up to me, and with this wolfish smile on his lips, asks me for a can of lighter fluid. I fetch him what he asks for, making a little small talk as I ring him up on the register. I asked him where he's from. D.C., he replies, just passing through. I gave him a polite smile and asked him if he was one of those politician types, to which he gives the vague reply of something like that. 
He then proceeds to take out the biggest roll of dollar bills I'd ever seen in my life, all hundreds from what I could tell, then places one down on the counter in front of me. I give the man his change, remarking that it's a good thing it had been a busy previous few hours or he'd have wiped me out for change. I said it in this fairly jokey tone, expecting him to at least give a polite chuckle in return, but he doesn't so much as smirk. He just takes out the Zippo lighter from his suit pocket, just about the shiniest I'd ever seen, and proceeds to fill it up with the lighter fluid right there in front of me. I've seen a fair few of those lighters in my time, but never one that I could have sworn was plated with silver. I figured he must have been hankering for a smoke, something fierce, and I told him as such, but he replied that he didn't smoke. Right as he says that, he finishes up filling up his lighter, but not before accidentally spilling a little of the lighter fluid onto his finger. Then just before he pieces the shiny looking Zippo back together, he brings the finger to his mouth and sucks the drop of flammable liquid from his finger like it was a drop of homemade wine or something. Now, naturally, I quietly recoil when he does that, not quite being able to believe what I just witnessed. He sees me do so and shoots me another one of those wolfish grins like he enjoyed the idea of freaking me out like that. I was just on the verge of asking him what that was all about when I hear the doorbell of the general store tinkle again. I look over towards the front entrance and in walks this young lady who looks to be about the same age as my little sister, couldn't have been no older than about 14 years old. Only she's dressed much younger, almost like how you'd expect a toddler to dress, in this denim skirt type thing with white embroidered flowers on it. She addresses him as daddy, so I figured it was his daughter, and tells him she needs to use the bathroom. The man in the suit then turns to me, asks if there's a bathroom that his daughter can use, so I give him the key to one that we had inside the store. Only instead of just handing it to his kid, he takes out a little leather wallet looking thing from his jacket and hands that, the lighter, then the key to the little lady, who then makes her way off towards the door before locking it behind her. I started to feel incredibly uncomfortable. Something about the whole situation just didn't sit right with me at all. I had a sneaking suspicion of what was contained inside the small leather wallet thing, but I didn't feel like I was in any position to confront the suited man on it, especially not based solely on a hunch. But it wasn't just that. The kid looked absolutely nothing like him. She had these soft, rounded, delicate features along with real curly hair while the suited man's face was so sharp he looked like he could have cut a swath through a pumpkin patch. And the way she called him Daddy, a girl that age should be well on to calling her father Dad, Pop, or anything but Daddy. I tried to distract from my discomfort by asking him where he and his daughter were headed. You ask a lot of questions, don't you, young man? He replied, dropping what had once been a kind of formal civility entirely and proceeded to stare a hole through me. His eyes, man. He had these narrow brown eyes so dark that were almost black and I felt a shudder run through me as he fixed his gaze to mine. Just making conversation, I remember saying back to him, shifting nervously behind the counter. Well, you know how the old saying goes, don't you? His voice was smooth, just creepily calm like there was no emotion behind it whatsoever. Curiosity killed the cat. The suited man turned, then started walking up and down the aisles, eyeing up the products like we were some quaint backwater relic, which I suppose was exactly what we were. I get back to cleaning house for a minute or two, only it's more just going through the motions while I keep an eye on what this guy's doing. I figured it'd only be a minute or two before his kid emerges from the bathroom and they fix to get back on the road. But five minutes goes by, then ten, and still no sign of her. Just as I'm about to ask him if he thinks she's okay in there, the bathroom door unlocks with a loud snap and the door opens up. There's no flush, nothing to indicate she'd actually been using the bathroom for its intended purpose, and when she emerges, she seems all sleepy and dozy looking. Then she hands back the keys, the lighter, and the black leather wallet to the suited man in a daze before giving him a lazy sounding, thank you daddy. 
The way she said it right then, I knew he wasn't her father and he was dripping with sleaze. And the look he gave her in return was one a father should never, ever give his daughter under any circumstances. It made me sick to my stomach and I wanted the pair of them out of my store immediately. But we rarely just come out and say something like that where I'm from. We'll say something with an implication if you catch my drift. Safe travels now. I remember saying to the suited man. My tone was friendly, but the look I gave him was not. He turns and looks at me like he was about to go through me for shortcut, like he could have eaten me without salt there and then. Then he walks up to the counter, places the bathroom key down on top of it, and says one final thing to me. Remember, young man, curiosity killed the cat. And then he walks that little lady out of the store and then drove off into the night. I seriously considered calling the sheriff right after they left. But what was I going to tell him? That a man was traveling with a girl that appeared to be his daughter? I'd be laughed right off the line. I could have mentioned that I thought that there was something illegal in the leather wallet that he'd handed her, but I got the distinct impression that nothing we could ever accuse him of was really going to stick. He had all that money, and that look he gave me too. So I didn't say a word to anyone. But for the remaining few hours of my shift, and for the next few days, I heard his words rattling around my skull whenever I paid any mind to him at all. Curiosity. Killed. The cat. My friends and I went on a camping trip for three days in the desert last fall, 2019. We went out to hike, explore, and go shooting where we could without posing danger to anyone else. There were about seven of us in total, and of those seven, myself and two others are emergency medical professionals. We'll call my two EMS friends A and E. We set up camp near the road in an area that had an embankment that would make for a good and safe range. The first day and night went well. However, I remember as the sun was setting, a truck slowly drove by with a large trailer in tow. Normally this wouldn't catch my eye, but I noticed the cargo, though covered, didn't look like it could be any sort of camping gear, and the truck bed was empty. The two men in the cab of the vehicle and I locked eyes as they passed. I gave a friendly wave and a smile, but they just stared at me, emotionless. After a moment, they both turned away and floored it out of sight, trailer rumbling in suit. I didn't think much of it at the time, so just went about my business for the night until bedtime. My second day was full of more hiking and shooting. We stopped at around dusk as to not disturb other nearby campers with loud gunfire. As darkness fell, we made our bonfire and cracked open a beer and just talked for quite some time. Amid the conversation, I saw a slight reddish glow drop behind a nearby hill and vanish. I brought it up with the group and asked, Did anyone else see that? No one else had seen what I did, so I excused it as mistaking it as an ember from the fire. Around ten minutes go by and I see it again, except it was high in the sky and deeper into the desert. It's a flare, said one of the group. An emergency flare, maybe, I added. We decided that if we see another one go off, some of us would go see if there was anyone in need of help, as we brought advanced medical supplies. A few minutes go by, and sure enough, we spot another flare, a little bit west of where the last one was seen. We made a plan, A, E, myself, and another one of our friends who we'll call Jay, and we would venture out in A's truck to find whoever needed help. Now certain areas of the desert we were in has been used by cartels as hidden transport routes before, so we also brought some of our firearms just in case we needed to protect ourselves from an attack. We loaded up our medical equipment, hopped into the truck and began driving out, leaving the others to keep watch if whoever needed help came to the camp. We headed in the direction of the last flare scene, windows rolled down, listening for calls for help, as well as announcing that if someone was in distress, they should call out to us. Continuing on, another flare shot up further west than the last, illuminating the rocky hills in a dim red hue. I called out the direction, and we found a small dried ravine that we could use as passage. 
We turned down the dark ravine and drove for some time, the only light being that of the truck which only seemed to make the overwhelming darkness that much more imposing. All while calling out but hearing nothing in return, another flare came up close by, but still too far to see anyone. We continued forward until we hit the end of the ravine, which led to somewhat of a natural cul-de-sac surrounding by rocky hills on three sides. We hopped out and searched the area for a bit with our flashlights. We yelled out again, but no one responded. It was empty, but we could have sworn this was where it came from. After searching a bit more to be thorough, we decided to check another area down the main road. The end of the ravine was tight for the truck, but there was just enough room to make a U-turn. Jay and I decided to hop in the truck bed for the search so we could see more than what the back seat would allow. As we turned out, a large cloud of dust and gravel hit me with a loud accompanying hiss. What the F just happened? yelled A. Think you blew a tire there, buddy, I replied. We hopped out and inspected and found that his rear passenger side tire had blown, but I noticed something a bit off. The blow was on the wall of the tire and clean, not on the bottom and jagged as would be if it hit a sharp rock. I brought up how suspicious that was, but they reasoned that it must have just been a larger sharp stone. As they got to work replacing the tire with a spare, I stood watch. There was some difficulty with changing the wheel, the tire iron bent, and so did one of the lug nuts. As they worked, I heard something approach me quickly from the darkness. I immediately turned and drew my pistol, turning the light towards the sound. A large rock had rolled down one of the jagged hills to my right and stopped about ten feet from me. I shone my light up to the top. I didn't see anything but some small rocks and gravel still tumbling down the slope. I almost laughed at how I reacted, but then another rock began tumbling down towards me, a few feet away from the same area. I shined my light again, but saw no one. I became a bit paranoid. Those rocks were too big to be moved by any animal and they both came from the same direction. I relayed the information to my friends but they blew it off saying I was getting too paranoid. I agreed that was a possibility but I never let my guard down. My gut feeling was telling me something was wrong. I was on edge the whole time, even thinking to myself that the flares might be some kind of trap or lure. In the meantime we were cracking jokes about our luck. Hey, this situation sucks, but I'm glad I'm in it with y'all, said A, and the feeling was mutual. My buddies had just finished up replacing the tire when yet another flare rocketed off in the sky near the ravine entrance we took and fell back down to earth nearby. We called out as we loaded back up into the truck, but once more, we were met with silence. We drove back down to the beginning of the trail and saw no one. We began to doubt if anyone was in trouble and if it was just some dumb kids playing around with a flare gun which is illegal to misuse. With that said, we weren't going to give up that easily. We began driving deeper into the desert on the main road when another flare was spotted. This one was what puzzled us. Up until then, they were all in roughly the same area. This one was way further northwest of the last one. How are they all the way over there now? I wondered. If these are some idiot teens doing this, we needed to tell them that they can't just go off causing worry like that. It's, it's really irresponsible, said E. We did agree that if that's the case, we should talk to them and their parents. We don't take emergencies lightly. We pushed on towards the last seen light, which led us to something that puzzled us even more. We arrived at a dark campsite surrounded by two hills. The headlights revealed two tents, scattered belongings, and an old fire pit. We exited the vehicle and began our approach on foot, but something was wrong. The tents were unoccupied, but still had a load of gear inside and out, and the fire pit was clearly stomped out with coals just barely glowing. It looked like it was quickly abandoned. Even if they went hiking or out on a walk, they left their equipment, shoes, packs, everything. As I searched, I found an even more unsettling sight. Shotgun shells. 12 gauge and they weren't old. They had to have been fired recently, 
there was no dust on them. Even after half a day in the desert, they'd be covered in dirt carried by the wind, and they still smelled of gunpowder. I showed my buddies and they agreed this was too odd. We later found deep tire marks like someone left in a hurry. And that's when I saw it. It was an ominous orange glow coming from over the north hill that overlooked the abandoned campsite. I asked E to accompany me to go check it out. As we ascended the hill, we heard a small noise grow louder and louder. Once we reached the top, we looked down into a barren valley to see what I couldn't make out at first. What's that? asked E. I didn't answer him at first as I was focused on what was before us. Roughly fifty yards away, there was a large circle of dark figures in hoods and robes, arms stretched to their sides and all of them vocalizing in a low chant. In the center was a wide ring of fire, and in the center of the flames, revealed by the fire's light, was an immensely large black pyramid frame. I mean, this thing was giant. A bit off behind the group, the truck and trailer I saw earlier was some other vehicles. I think it's a cult, I replied. As I spoke those words, the chanting stopped, and the group of what must have been fifty people all turned towards us in silence. At that moment I realized I never turned off my flashlight. They all raised their arms once more and let out a horrifying and loud wail. First just one, and then they all began to join in until the sound was overtaking my own thoughts. We gotta get the F out of here, now! I told E in a hushed but anxious tone. We turned and booked it down the hill. Start the truck! E yelled. A and J looked at us confused and almost amused. <laughs> Why is that? Chuckled A. It's a cult, and they know we're here. I explained out of breath. A and J could see that we weren't playing, and so he ushered us into the truck and we hauled it out and back to camp. As we got back onto the main road, something happened that made A and J fully believe us and confirmed my suspicions about the flares. From every hill along the main road, flares shot up into the sky from all sides, illuminating the desert around us, either a warning or a threat. As we would drive, more and more would fly above us, encompassing the sky above until we got far enough away and the flares fell and faded behind us. We got back and explained everything to the rest of camp, happy to be back with our lives. They looked as though they didn't fully believe it, but they also knew we wouldn't just make something up like this. We speculated that that was either some kind of lure or a warning system for the cult. We slept close that night and kept firearms nearby. When we awoke, we cleaned up and got ready to leave. I was clearing debris from the range when I stumbled onto something that wasn't there before. A small wooden pyramid frame, charred black and still smoldering. I called attention to it and we promptly left. We got back and went on with our lives. I think back to this event every now and then and I'm thankful that my friends and I weren't harmed and I hope the owners of that abandoned camp were able to escape unscathed. I have no idea what that cult was or who those people were. I have no clue if they were a legitimate cult or just some people trying to prank campers. I'm fortunate that I've not had any other run-ins like this, but I now know there are some strange people in that desert. So this happened all the way back in the late 1990s when I was a college sophomore. Me and the girl I was dating at the time had been going steady for about eight months, and since she was my first real girlfriend, my mom was pretty keen to meet her. And what better time than the holidays to introduce her to the folks? During the week before Christmas, my mom's family traditionally held quite a large gathering up at my uncle's place over in Sandy, in my home state of Oregon. Pretty much all my extended family head out there year after year from all over the Portland area, and since they've gotten word that I was bringing my girlfriend, the hype to meet her was huge. I won't lie, I was kind of nervous that they'd embarrass me in front of her, but that anxiety was totally misplaced. She got along really well with all of them, and despite some playful humiliation when the cousin of mine told her the story of how I literally peed my pants at the haunted mansion ride when I was a kid, they were a credit to me. And when it came to driving her back home, she seemed to be more into me than ever. 
We'd agreed to drive back down to Eugene at like 7pm so I wouldn't be too tired driving back. But since we had such a good time, we stayed way later than we had planned to and didn't get on the road until about 10.30pm that evening. In the hopes of making the journey a little faster, I ended up taking the OR211 instead of just sticking to the I-5S for the whole drive. Annoyingly, this didn't quite actually make the journey any faster, but point being, the OR211 was pretty much surrounded by farms or these huge swaths of dense pine forest. So as you can imagine, big stretches of it aren't lit very well at all, and for some parts of the drive, we were moving through complete darkness, saved only by our car's headlights. But honestly, I wasn't all worried about it. I was pretty good at reading a map, and once I was back on the I-5, a road I knew pretty well, I figured everything would be all good. So we're just cruising along, in high spirits, talking about how goofy some of my family were, but generally my girlfriend was singing their praises and telling how she couldn't wait to meet them again. It's right around then that we hit a section of the highway that descends down this big old hill, heading up to the bridge crossing over Deep Creek. There, the highway is sandwiched by some of the densest forests you've ever likely seen, and there is absolutely nothing lighting up the highway. It's the only thing we can see from the front seats of the car is like maybe 20 or 30 feet that our headlights are illuminating, and pretty much nothing else. But like I said, we're in high spirits, completely unprepared for what was about to happen. Right as the highway was starting to level off, Something darts across the front of us so fast and so suddenly that I barely was smashing into it. I break so hard that I almost gave the pair of us whiplash, then when we're stopped, both me and my girlfriend are in a complete frenzy of, Oh God, did you see that? What was that? There are plenty of deer in that area of Oregon, plenty of coyotes too, but the thing that ran out in front of us was way too big to be a coyote, and something about the way it moved gave me this gut feeling that it wasn't a deer either. The shape was just way too slender, almost like whatever was out there had moved on two legs, not four. Now next thing, I know how completely dumb this sounds in retrospect, but my curiosity just got the better of me and I decided I wanted to investigate. So again, this was also incredibly dumb, I turned the car like 90 degrees in the highway so I could point our headlights into the woods. Yes, this could have caused a horrible accident if another car had come along at the same time I was doing this, but I don't think I was thinking straight at the time. You see, as a kid growing up in the Pacific Northwest, I've heard a lot of stories about Bigfoot and Sasquatch, and I'd be lying if I said that they didn't capture my imagination. No, I'm not saying that I thought I'd caught a glimpse of Gigantopithecus or anything. I know the stories are mostly exactly that, just stories, but... A part of me just wanted to be sure. So like I said, I turned the car 90 degrees, turned on the high beams and stepped out of the driver's side and onto the highway. I stare off into the trees for a minute or two, but I don't see a thing. Nothing is moving out there, and the whole scene was as quiet as the grave. But as I'm looking, I get this feeling in the pit of my stomach and start to feel as if though I've made a huge error of judgment. It was one of the most intensely terrifying feelings I'd ever felt in my entire life, a feeling like I was being watched by something predatory. I know it's a huge cliche and the whole I felt like I was being watched thing is such a tired old trope, but I don't really know any other way to phrase it. My heart was pounding, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing on end, and my gut just turned to ice. So without turning my back to the woods where I expected the danger to come from, I started edging back towards the car. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, I practically jump out of my skin when I hear the car's horn letting off one long, excruciatingly loud extended blast. I mean, it scared me so bad that I almost straight up peed my pants haunted mansion style. My first thought was that my girlfriend had ended up leaning on the horn as she climbed over into the driver's seat for some reason because she'd done that once or twice before. But as I turn back around, I can see she's still on the passenger side, but that she's actually leaning over to push the horn in what was evidently a frenzied attempt to get my attention. I run back to the car and ask her if she's okay, but she doesn't say a single word to me. She just points off to a spot about 50 feet away from where we parked. I spin my head around to see what she's pointing at, and that's when I see it. 
what was, without a shadow of a doubt, the thing that had run in front of our car just a few minutes prior. Lit up by the residual light of our high beams, what I saw was really obviously a man, but he was covered in animal furs, would look like a mishmash of deer skins, bear skins, and elk skins, and on his head, secured in a way I'm not even sure of, were these antlers. At the time, because of how closely it was to the holidays, I remember the words reindeer man just flashed into my mind, maybe in the naive hope that the dude was dressed that way out of some misdirected festive spirit, but he certainly didn't seem in any kind of festive spirit, not in the least bit. Like I couldn't see his eyes because of the weird kind of head covering he had on, but I could see his mouth, and at first he kind of looked like he was giving us a smile. Only as I looked, I could see it wasn't a smile at all. This guy was just baring his teeth to us, like the way chimps do as some kind of warning. After that, he turned and walked off into the forest, never to be seen again. Obviously, right after that, me and my girlfriend just got out of there and got back onto the roads towards the I-5. It took us both a while to calm our nerves, but my girlfriend was particularly shaken up, and that's because she'd seen something that I hadn't. And as we drove on, she explained exactly what that was. While I'd been staring off into the woods, looking for Sasquatch or whatever, she'd noticed him out of her peripheral vision, but was basically frozen in fear for a moment or two as she watched him walking slowly towards me. Or rather, walking isn't the right word. From how she described it, this guy was stalking, the way a hunter might stalk a deer. The way she puts it, she had to summon up pretty much all of her courage to be able to lean over and honk the horn the way she did. Then when Reindeer Man had heard the honking, he would backed off a little before I saw him and like I said, he kind of just froze in place before disappearing. I did a fair amount of online research when I got home to try and find out if anyone else had any run-ins with this guy, but there was absolutely nothing online about him. There are plenty of crazy survivalist types up here in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm guessing he was one of those, but they tend to be pretty open about their existence, sometimes even advertise themselves as militiamen or whatever, whereas the reindeer man seemed like he was living completely off the grid. I don't live in Oregon anymore. Me and my girlfriend during the encounter broke up at the end of college, but when we were still together and I happened to be driving down towards Eugene, I always avoided the stretch of highway that I saw the reindeer man on. I've told this story a lot over the years and some people honestly just think I'm making it up as like a campfire tale or something. But it's not a tale. It's not made up. And it's definitely not just intended to be some dumb spoopy story. It's most definitely a warning to anyone traveling on that road at night because if my girlfriend wasn't with me when he ran out in front of the car... If she wasn't there to spot him before he crept up on me, only to scare him off with a blast of the horn. I honestly might not be here to warn you guys. So please, this holiday season, drive careful, drive slow, and do not stop for any reason on dark, deserted stretches of forest highway.